Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In Jesus' name, welcome to Augustus on this seventh Sunday of Easter, brought to you through the miracle of modern technology as we practice social distancing. In this service today, we will focus on Christian suffering and what that means for us in the midst of our current circumstances. secrets are hid. Cleanse the faults of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. 
as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, your Son, our Savior, is with you in eternal glory. Give us faith to see that, true to his promise, he is among us still today and will be with us to the end of time, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts. When the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, 
Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The Word of the Lord. A reading from 1st Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory, which is the Spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith. For you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The Word of the Lord. according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. After Jesus had spoken these words to his disciples, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Let's keep going. Let me take a drink. Okay. And we'll do the sermon. Now, here's a little tip. If you can, try to, when you look up at least once every three minutes, make sure you make a little bit of a grander gesture because that's when they go off. If they see that you're moving, they're going to keep going. Oh, okay. I mean, and you do it actually naturally enough, but if you feel like you've been going for a while and you haven't moved, look up, maybe move your arm, okay. something like that. But I... Point my finger accusingly. There you go. If, if you think God loves you. <laughs> okay, oh. and then I can sit and enjoy the sermon then. Okay. All right, good. And I'm even? No, that one side went right up, but just a little bit, less than before. Uh, can you stand still? We'll see. It's, uh, yeah, I think it's good. Let me see how it looks in the camera. It's really close, but I'm a perfectionist. It looks fine in the camera. Okay. Easter 7 Sermon Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Read the fine print. Know what you're getting into. These are words of caution for anyone signing a contract. Many a person has been surprised by a contract when he or she learned that something was written in the fine print. Some very popular preachers on every continent attract devotees by assuring people that followers of Jesus will be, will be blessed with good health, wealth, and security if only they believe. It is then a blow to their listeners' faith and confidence in Jesus when they come upon suffering and trials. Upon a closer examination of Scripture, with faithful pastors or friends, these folks realize that Jesus never promised such a thing. In fact, as we shall see, Jesus said something much different. The reality is that Christians will suffer for the name of Jesus. But, in the midst of their suffering and trials, the reality of Easter prepares you for the reality of discipleship. My friends, from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he called his first apostles, he spoke in very frank terms about what would happen to them because they had chosen to follow him. Jesus said they would be reviled, persecuted, and evil things would be said about them because they follow Jesus. Jesus told them to rejoice and be glad when those things would happen, because their reward would be great in heaven. Other times, he told the disciples that they would be handed over to authorities, 
to be beaten and punished. They would be hated by the world. Jesus also spoke of another type of suffering for those who follow him. Shortly after Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples, Jesus spoke to Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail you. Jesus, you see, never hid the reality of suffering for his namesake from his disciples. In fact, Jesus was quite graphic about the details of that suffering. But Jesus prepared his apostles for those times of suffering with encouragement and hope. When Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus told them, I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. Now listen closely to what follows immediately. Jesus continued, But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, that is, persecutions, you may remember that I told them to you. Then, right after Jesus told his disciples these things, he told them that the time had come when they would scatter out of fear, leaving Jesus all alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. Additionally, Jesus assured the disciples that he would continue to pray for them. My friends, this kind of straight talk about their suffering, along with Jesus' words of encouragement and comfort, would become very important to the apostles as they would continue the teaching of Jesus through their apostolic office. At the time, they didn't have a clue what kind of suffering they'd need to endure, even though they had heard these words from Jesus. But the Holy Spirit would remind them of the words of Jesus after Jesus was raised from the dead and in the days following. In time, the apostles lived the reality of suffering for the name of Jesus. My friends, you know this reality too. We suffer from anxiety, fear, and loneliness because of the COVID-19 pandemic. People that we know have become sick and have died. We live in such comfort and affluence, and yet we have to deal with people who worry us, who cause fear in us, not only that they may die, but that we too may become sick. And in the midst of all of this, we have to deal with people who think that because they are Christians, they should not have to suffer. And their faith is weaker, and the devil is prowling around like a lion, ready to devour them. My friends, the apostles continue this kind of frank talk about their suffering for Jesus' sake as part of their catechetical instruction to the church especially as the church began to grow and was increasingly dispersed. The opening of Peter's pastoral letter indicates it is written to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter's letter to Jewish and Gentile converts in Asia Minor was to provide pastoral instruction about the Christian life in Jesus, including the reality of suffering. 
Just as Jesus told the apostles that he wanted them to know suffering was in store for them, so they would not fall away. Likewise, Peter echoed this reality in a pastoral way in our second reading, as if to say, he who has ears to hear, let that one hear. Peter says, Beloved, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Today we might say, forewarned is forearmed. When you are persecuted for following Jesus, when you are reviled, insulted, shunned, shut out, ridiculed, imprisoned, put to death, sifted as wheat by Satan through severe trials, do not be alarmed. There is no need to ask God why this is happening to you. There is no reason to be ashamed. This kind of suffering as a Christian is an uncomfortable, hot, and fiery trial to test you, Peter writes. Those of you in the field of metallurgy may know that when metals and ore are heated, it can be determined what their makeup is. Spiritual tests test us. They reveal our makeup. These fiery trials were often experienced by people of faith in the Old Testament, too. For example, God said to Israel through the prophet Isaiah, I have refined you, I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. My friends, fiery trials show us how weak and helpless we are left to ourselves. They reveal how utterly dependent we are on God's grace and mercy and how much we need the prayers of Jesus so that we may bear them. When we are in the midst of these trials, we are often driven more deeply into God's Word and into prayer. We yearn more for words of comfort and hope as we hear God's Word and receive the body and blood of Christ. It is only then that we are able to rejoice in our suffering. It is then as we hear the voice of God speak to us, just as clearly as Jesus spoke to the apostles, that we are reminded that we are not alone in our trials. And that gives us a whole new perspective. We can confess with assurance and joy, the Spirit of glory and God rests upon me. I am blessed when I am insulted, for I share Christ's sufferings, he has counted me worthy to suffer for his name. So, my friends, we need not despair in our trials, temptations, and suffering as though it were God who is choosing to punish us. No, it is quite the opposite. Rather, as Peter urges us, we entrust our soul to the faithful Creator so we can go about doing the good that God the Father has called us to do. In fact, we can let go of worrying about suffering and cast all our anxieties on Jesus because we are assured, because we know and believe that Jesus cares for us. The life of a Christian is secure in Jesus. However, Peter urges us, we must be watchful because we have an enemy that seeks to rob us of our Easter joy and our faithfulness to Christ. St. Peter reminds us to be watchful, to be vigilant. This is no game of make-believe Satan is real, so be watchful. Satan, our adversary, is prowling around 
like a lion seeking someone to devour. If in the midst of social distancing and sheltering in place, you have gone to TV or Facebook or, or YouTube or any place else online and watched videos of the wild, and you've seen lions in the wild, you know that they see their prey long before their prey sees them. The lion studies the movements and stealthily creeps along among the tall grass until the prey is caught not paying attention. And then the lion springs forth and it seeks, it sinks its teeth and its claws into its prey, putting the death grip of its jaws around its throat. That is a powerful image. That is the image that Peter wishes us to remember about Satan. Not only be watchful, but resist Satan when he tempts you. Peter says, remain firm in your faith. Hold on to the word of God in your heart and use it as Jesus did during the temptations by the devil in the wilderness. My friends, do not give up or let go of the word of God for anything. And know, believe, and trust that you are not alone. Not only does the Spirit of God rest upon you and go with you through these fiery trials, but countless Christians join you in the same situation. This type of suffering is experienced by your brothers and sisters in the faith throughout the world. Yes, you truly can, as Peter writes to us, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Here is the good news. In the midst of fiery trials, temptations, and COVID-19 pandemics, Satan is not in charge. Say it along with me at home. Satan is not in charge. The world who serves as Satan's puppet is not in charge. Say it along with me, the world is not in charge. The world is not in charge. Oh, it may appear that way. As he and the world inflict all sorts of warfare on Christians. But Jesus demonstrated that he is the Lord of Lords. Scripture tells us that Jesus descended into hell to announce his resurrection victory to all, right under the nose of Satan. Satan used worthless people to lie about Jesus and falsely accuse him, resulting in Jesus' crucifixion. But the reality is that no one, and not Satan, took Jesus' life. Jesus himself laid down his life willingly to be the perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world. What Satan intended for destruction, Jesus used for our salvation. When Jesus breathed his last, our sin was fully atoned. Satan thought that Jesus would be buried and forgotten as some misfit, but the Lord of life would not be contained. Having destroyed the curse of sin, Jesus birth burst forth from the tomb, swallowing up death and giving in its place everlasting life. He lives. Therefore, Peter says, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. My friends, there is no fine print to be concerned about in your discipleship of Jesus. There are no gimmicks. 
It is a reality that you will suffer trials for the name of Jesus, but they will not last forever. At the right time, Jesus, the mighty hand of God, will exalt you. He will restore you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. Your suffering will be over, and you will be with him in everlasting paradise, a paradise that he has prepared for you, rejoicing with gladness as his glory is revealed. And to those of us suffering the trials of temptation, that is good news, my friends. Amen. Christ is risen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came ever from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Almighty and everlasting God, gracious Father, in Jesus Christ you have burst open the tomb and triumphed over all sin and death forever in order that we might be raised up out of sin and death to live a new life. We pray that this resurrected life may come to our homes, our churches, and our world, and that we may worship the risen Christ not only with liturgy and song on Easter Sunday, but with hearts, hands, and voices all our days. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the church, for its pastors and bishops, for the newly baptized, for all the faithful, for this congregation here gathered, and for our growth in grace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all nations, for all rulers, legislators, and judges, for an increase of justice in our lands, and for all who work for peace among nations and among peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all in any need, for the hungry and the homeless, for victims of war and injustice, for prisoners, for all who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, for the sick and infirm, for all with incurable illness, and for all who this day will die. We pray especially for those we name in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. 
Hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for the members of our armed forces wherever they serve, and especially when they serve in harm's way, that they might speedily complete their mission and be safely reunited with their loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God the Father, who raised Christ from the dead, open to you the gate of everlasting life. Amen. God the Son, who burst forth from the grave, give you joy as you celebrate his resurrection. Amen. God the Holy Spirit, who brought you to birth in baptism, fill you with strength and peace. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Live